that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy Hello and welcome to the Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen. I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser known aspects of our local history. Joining me today is the fantastic Alicia Wickstead. Hi, Alicia. Hi, Chris. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. Good. Thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Uh, Alicia is an ensemble member in Unexpected Productions. Uh, she is a founding member of the horror comedy Blood Squad and she performs very regularly in many, many shows around the Seattle area. Am I leaving anything out? No, I, it's, it pretty much covers it. Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, so, Alicia, how long have you lived in Seattle? Uh, technically, uh, I'm about, uh, I'm 39 years old. Technically, I have lived in Seattle for 38 of those years. I was born in Tacoma. Oh, okay. Did you live in Tacoma for a year before you moved up here? Well, about. My parents moved to Crown Hill neighborhood in mm -hmm. Seattle when I was just about one years old. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. So you've lived here really your entire life. My entire life. Awesome, fantastic. Uh, how much do you know about the local history? I feel like I know a smattering about a lot of things and not a lot of detail about most okay. things. Okay. We've had many conversations and we've done projects together and yes. things. I, you definitely know more than... Almost everybody else that lives here about I, local history. I should hope so. I would say, yes, yes. absolutely. Cool. Uh, so, uh, I think I've been able to find a story, though, that I think that you haven't heard of. All right. I believe. Take, I believe. Bring we'll, it up. We'll see. It's a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of big talk. It is a lot of big talk. Let's see. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, let's get started. Mm -hmm. Friedrich Drumpf. Mm. Friedrich Drumpf was born in Karlstadt, Germany. Uh, March 14th, 1869. Okay. In his youth, he trained as a barber and worked on the family vineyard where he picked grapes. It's a lot of d disciplines all in the same guy. It is. So he's a family barber and also a, a, wine, a winer? What do you say? His a family wine? owned a winery. A they, winery. Own a, they own a vineyard. So if you work a vineyard, what are you? A vinter. You're oh, vinter. It's vinter. I, I believe it's vinter. No, I mean, that's probably right. Yeah, it sounds oh. very German as well. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. What an interesting fellow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, young Friedrich did not want to go into the family business. Mm. In 1885, at the age of 16, he crossed the Atlantic toward New York City to find his fortune in the New World. In the field of barbary. Well, in, in, in barber. whatever field. He didn't really want to be a barber, okay. but he knew how to do it. All right. Uh, there was a massive wave of German immigration to the U.S. happening around the time, and there were no caps on immigration in the mid-1880s. It's very so generous. Whoever wants to come over... Come on over. Not a fan of Donald Trump, I guess. <laughs> uh, in New York, he stayed in a small apartment with his sister and her husband, working as a barber and learning English. In a small apartment. In a small apartment, that's yeah. A, that's Immigrant New York. That's tough. Yeah, yeah, probably a small tenement building. Yeah, well. Right on top of each other. Sure. Uh, so in New York, he, stayed with, uh, where he worked as a barber and was learning English. Uh, he decided to head out west with what little money he had saved from working as a barber to make a go of things in the Pacific Northwest. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. In 1891, he arrived in Seattle and spent $600 to buy a restaurant called the Poodle Dog. <laughs> so first of all, great name. The Poodle Dog? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, a poodle is a dog. Mm -hmm. Not all dogs are poodles. Yes, exactly. You could just name it the poodle, but the poodle dog. Uh, were there other types of animals that were that have like poodle uh, versions of them? Uh, like, was it important at that point in history to differentiate poodle dog versus I don't know. poodle cow? What's well, like saying <laughs> kitty cat? I think. Oh, okay. in that use, it, all, all poodle, kitties are cats. Who's a poodle dog? Who's a poodle dog? You're yeah. a poodle dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he moved, so to do that, and how old was he at this point? He was, let's see, 1891, so he would have been about 22. Oh, okay. So he's a, he's a young man. Yeah, that's fairly young. Wait a minute, I had another question about that. So, wait, the, so he moved out here, he started a restaurant. Uh, he bought an existing restaurant. Oh, that was So the question. Poodle Dog was a restaurant that had already existed. It was a, a, primarily an oyster restaurant. I, not his name. His name wasn't the Poodle Dog. He actually changed it to the Dairy Restaurant. Oh, 
Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So six hundred dollars was that a lot back then? It would have been a fair amount. Multiply that by about forty. Well, that's a lot. And that would have been yeah. Okay. Uh, the Poodle Dog was located at 208 Washington Street, mm-hmm. um, and it operated in Seattle's infamous Skid Road district, also known as the Lava Beds, known today as Pioneer Square. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the restaurant was just a block away from another German immigrant, Madame Lou Graham, oh. who won one of the highest end and most notorious brothels in Seattle at the time. You don't say. And of course, you know who Madame Lou Graham is. I do. You actually played Madame Lou Graham in a in a recent production, correct? Full disclosure. Yes. Yes. Excellent. That so is you're true. you're familiar with. Lou Graham. Yes. Yeah, this and is just, the Skid Road District, yeah. more or less. Yeah, and this is just a block away from where, where Lou Graham's brothel was operating. Mm-hmm. Uh, a block in the other direction was the People's Theater, mm-hmm. theater, a box house featuring gambling, drinking, burlesque, and, of course, prostitution. Of course. Uh, from Friedrich's biography by Gwenda Blair, uh, quote, He had a hard way with a nickel and spent little on ambiance. The sawdust he sprinkled on the floor lay in a muddy, uh, muddy manure-dotted clumps by noon. A few notices hung tacked on the wall, greasy with wood smoke and the soot from lanterns. The wiry, energetic proprietor darted among the long tables and headed, uh, and his head filled with orders taken and filled and calculations of profit and loss. Ten to twelve hours a day, he carried pitchers of beer and plates of food, attended the shouted commands of customers and friends, stuffed slips of paper and heavy silver dollars into his po- the pockets of his denim trousers. At sunset, the lamps went on and sometimes candles were lit on the table. The din continued without a break. Wow. Okay, so first of all, doesn't sound like a classy place. Tight with the what was the phrase? Tight with a nickel. He was a uh, he was uh, had a hard way with a nickel. <laughs> a hard, I've had a couple hard ways with nickels <laughs> in my life. So it so, so that makes it sounds like he's the owner, the bookkeeper, mm-hmm. the waiter. Did he also cook? He does everything. He literally did. I, he, he literally he, run the place he by might, himself. He pretty much ran the place by himself. I don't think That's he was the crazy. cook. I think he probably had a cook in the okay. back. But he ran. He, he he owned the place. He ran the whole place. He yeah. yeah. And it, the place looked like hell because he didn't spend any money yeah. on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. He did. All right. He did. Yeah. Well, he sounds like a an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur. Very much so. Trying to make a buck. Very much so. So far, I'm on his side. <clears throat> Excellent. Oh. Uh, so the, he changed the name to the Dairy Restaurant, mm-hmm. and the establishment advertised quote private rooms for ladies. Oh, hold on a minute. Now, dairy, <laughs> I should ask, D-A-R-Y, I assume, uh, like a D- dairy cow? D- yeah, a dairy like a dairy cow, D-A-I-R-Y. Okay. And he had uh, private rooms? Uh, private in, rooms for ladies. In which it was, uh, okay. It's, so it was it was a house of prostitution, I, basically. All right, I understand. So what did the, <laughs> what did the dairy, why, why the dairy house? The dairy restaurant? Yeah. Because probably they served dairy there. Because, okay, it, it, nothing it. to do with the prostitution. No, nothing. There's a lot of things they did no, back then. No, not like derriere. That you could pay for. Oh, yeah. well, I wasn't even thinking that. <laughs> I was thinking of from a, you know, just a, an honest a milking question. Mm-hmm. That's not. We can move on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his restaurant slash parlor did well. And there was no shortage of a market for food, liquor, or sex in old Seattle. Uh, Washington became a state in 1889. Mm -hmm. And the first time Washington residents were able to vote in a presidential election was in 1892. Cleveland versus Harrison. Mm, It's a good year. Yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, There was a run on the courts to apply for citizenship. Mm -hmm. Friedrich joined the lines and filed the paperwork in the downtown Seattle courthouse and swore his oath to the U.S., testifying, quote, During all of said time here, he has behaved as a man of good moral character. Oh, now, with that, considering uh, what happened in his dairy restaurant, mm-hmm. uh, dairy, the dairy, uh, d- would that have been a false statement, or was no. moral character more of a, it like, was, he didn't kill people? It was looser at the time. Okay. Moral character was definitely looser. Okay. Yeah. All right. So as far as he was concerned, everything was, was more or less above board. Yeah, essentially. Okay. Mm-hmm. It, what he was doing was it wouldn't necessarily have been considered, like, greatly outstanding outside of the norms of society yeah. that he was operating in. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, it was upon becoming a U.S. citizen, he legally changed his name hmm. from Friedrich Drumpf to Frederick Trump. Oh! <laughs> That's funny. I yeah. said Trump earlier. You did. And I he's did, which I did not. Probably best known today for being the grandfather of Donald Trump. No, he is yes, not. Yes, he is. Here in Seattle? Here in Seattle. I had no idea. Yeah. That is that's really that's yeah. very funny. Okay, great. Uh, so he's an immigrant. Yes. Uh, moved to Seattle, German heritage. Trump. Why did he choose that? Was it just a name that it was, he liked? It was similar. So Friedrich Trump. It would be similar in English to Frederick Trump. Okay. And Trump means meant kind of the same thing in German that it did in. I mean, it would have been. 
uh, kind of like the trump card or coming out on top kind of a thing. So it, That'd make, okay. it, it's it's a it's a good name choice. I mean, it's a good sure. strong name, sure, I mean, especially for someone in his profession. He's an entrepreneur. Yeah, he is. Yeah, so right. this is Donald Trump's grandfather we're well, talking about. Good. So far, I like him a little better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, about 75 miles northeast of Seattle, in the small town of Monte Cristo, mm-hmm. gold and silver ore had been discovered. Where exactly is, Mo- is there, Monte Cristo doesn't... Not really, it's a ghost town now. What would it be closest to? Uh, so if you know, out on Highway 2, where mm-hmm. like Gold Bar and... Yes. It's, it's north of there. Okay. So it's about, I mean, you, I, I actually looked up on Google Maps how to get to Monte Cristo, mm-hmm. and Google Maps said you cannot get there. Oh, like so. it's just there's a semblance of what there once was, but it's not. Right. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know if there's even roads that go out there anymore. Well, and if I'm there gonna, are, there. Now I'm gonna look. I I want to go there because okay. it sounds cool. Because if it's apparently this old mining ghost town, that sounds yeah, pretty awesome. It does. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Google Maps said no, you can't go there. Mm-hmm. So oh, all right. Yeah, so well, according to Google, I trust you. Them. Stay away, Alicia. I, I trust them with most <laughs> things. Uh, so because gold and, silver, sil- gold and silver ore were discovered, mining companies began popping up, and people rushed to make claims on the land. Mm. John Rockefeller made sizable investments in the small town, which only added to fuel speculation that Monte Cristo was going to be the next big thing. Mm-hmm. Frederick Trump saw an incredible opportunity and decided to seize it. Okay. Trump had no intention of mining. Uh, there was far easier and more certain methods of making money during such a time. Mm-hmm. He traveled to Monte Cristo with the intent on staking a claim. Then if any gold or silver was discovered nearby, he would be able to sell the claim. Gotcha. So not actually mining, just saying, hey, this neighboring claim found some ore. There's probably some ore down here. Oh. You should buy this claim off of me for more money. Right. <clears throat> so essentially buying unproven land, hoping that's going to be near land that somebody else is going to spend the money to prove. And they can go buy this you might get lucky. Exactly. Strike gold. Okay. Exactly. So it's really a it's a it's a low risk potentially high yield investment. Oh yeah, absolutely. That being a f- appropriate. That would be, yes. I'm not an economist. Very well said. Okay. Well, you fooled me. Oh good. You fooled, I would I would assume you are an economist being able to talk like that. For all you know, I am. Yeah. Uh, he established a claim. Unfortunately for him, the spot of land he chose was a smaller section of a larger claim that had already been filed by a man named L- Nicholas Rudebeck. So we take, there's a big piece of land claimed by Nicholas Rudebeck, and he unknowingly tries to claim a smaller portion of land on that larger parcel. Okay. Of course, uh, this did not dissuade Frederick in the slightest from setting up shop on the property. Oh, now hold on a minute. So I don't understand the process of staking claims exactly. You go and you file, uh, file some paperwork. So there was, there's not like some sort of a claims office where someone goes, oh, oh, no, no, that land is already claimed by somebody. I'm not sure how this misunderstanding took place, okay. but it, it did essentially. So he's got paperwork saying it's his land, but there's other pre, pre-made paperwork or longer, uh, standing paperwork saying right. that it, it's claimed by this other person. So it's kind of between these two guys to sort it out? Uh, kind of. Okay. Yeah. Uh, essentially if there is a legal dispute, it would go to Rudebeck because he was there first. Gotcha. So, but this, of course, Frederick starts setting up shop. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, uh, filing a mineral claim, uh, gives you the right to mine the land, but it does not give you the right to build or operate a business on it. Okay. So he built and operated a boarding house on the property. Oh, now very so now he attested to being uh, of good moral fiber <laughs> when he <laughs> applied to be a citizen, changed his name to Trump, and now he is knowingly doing something shady. He is knowingly doing something shady. Cuz you're not supposed to run a business. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so he set up a boarding house, and he made a decent living providing to uh miners providing living spaces and other entrepreneurial services. Oh, such as? Such as. You know what I'm talking about. No, I don't. Oh, yeah, probably some prostitution going on in there. Oh, I see. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed. Yes. Uh, From his biography by Gwenda Blair, quote, In such a frontier environment, it was hard to say precisely what went on in any particular establishment. Mm -hmm. Few records remain. As with his dairy restaurant in Seattle, it's possible that Frederick Trump never served anything stronger than chamomile tea and refused to admit any unmarried, unmarried woman. But the young German immigrant was no fool, and not one to be scared of vice. Sleeves rolled up, he stood at the cash register, taking in a constant, if not overwhelming, stream of profits. Okay, so, so what, so Gwenda, is Gwenda the name of this 
Gwenda Blair. Blair. Gw- that's a lovely name. Yeah, isn't that cool? I like it. Uh, so what she's saying is he could very well have just been money could uh, be exchanged for the hand holding of a of a nice single lady. Yeah, uh, and they sit and drink water together. Probably he was raking in the dough because they were doing some crazy shit. Right. Yes. There. Okay. Probably. Yeah. He was probably running a place where they served alcohol and and prostitution was easily available. Gotcha. And not necessarily. A, it depends on how you classify a pimp. But he was probably not in the pimp in the traditional sense. But he mm. probably allowed. He pr- provided an environment for prostitution to be taking place in. Oh, so perhaps he did not necessarily have a stable of ladies. Yes. But he could be the guy you came to, and you could ask, like, "Hey, can you hook me up?" I'm going crazy down at the lake. Right, yeah. Or if you go to his establishment, there would be people that weren't necessarily under his employ, but women that would be there willing to have services. He's a guy who could hook you up. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. The fall of 1893 was tough, and the winter that year was even harder. Snow began to dump on the small mountain town, uh, making getting supplies there difficult and mining nearly impossible. Most residents left, hoping to return in spring and continue digging. Hmm. Trump stayed, hoping to protect his building and make it through the winter to continue to make money serving the miners. Okay. That December... Nicholas Rudebeck incorporated his own business, the Rudebeck Land Company, with some other investors back in Everett. Because Trump had built property that he had been living and profiting on on Rudebeck's land, it meant that he now had the legal right to charge Trump back rent. Oh, okay. So up till this point, I guess we haven't talked about this in a little while, Rudebeck and Trump, were they just like, just going about their business, ignoring each other until he got to this point, and then now he's like, I'm going to stick it to this guy? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It's, it, the filing of the land, and he, he filed a patent on his land, which meant essentially mm-hmm. that he didn't just have mineral rights, he had all rights on this land now. Right. Um, and so, before that, it probably would not have been in his best interest to be like, okay, you can operate your boarding house, I don't really care. Um, but now, this is a different story. So yeah. now he owns the land, and now he can say, you've been operating on my land, mm-hmm. I have all this previous paper work, so right. I can start charging you back rent. What you gonna do now? What you gonna do now, Trump? Mm-hmm. Uh, in response to this, Trump filed a second claim on a piece of land just adjacent to Rudebeck's claim, hoping to argue to any surveyors that the boarding house resided on the new claim and not Rudebeck's. <laughs> okay, so you've got the original piece of land, you've got Trump's little piece, of, mm-hmm. like, on a corner of the land, and he's like, okay, I'm going to buy this little corner that's next to the larger piece, and then I'm going to be like, wait a minute, my business is technically on the other side of this line that I've just drawn now, just for this reason of disputing what you're trying to do. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Crafty. Yeah. Uh, so they had to wait until April for the mm-hmm. surveying to be done because there was so much snow on the ground, mm-hmm. about 10 feet of snow on the ground. Mm-hmm. During the intervening time... Trump convinced a surveyor to include in the paperwork that the t- a two-story boarding house worth $800 stood on his new claim. Okay. So when he's finally claiming, he's saying, put on the paperwork that there's a, I, I checked it out, there's a two-story boarding house there. He convinced that man to lie. Well, the surveyor complied because the presence of such a building should have no bearing on any future, future disputes over a mineral claim. Oh. So their survey said, oh, he checked out that land, there's a two-story boarding house, yeah, I'll put that on there because that has absolutely no bearing on the paperwork that I'm actually doing right now. But Trump is putting it on there because it will provide a paper trail to support his claim that the boarding house was on this other piece of land the entire time. Because he doesn't want to be charged this back rent. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the surveyor is like, I'm not interested in what's on top right. of the land yeah. unless it's pulling mineral from the soil. Exactly. At the, his position. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Well, uh, Trump also contacted R.L. Polk and Company, an organization that compiled local directories around the country and compelled them to include under listings for Monte Cristo, Frederick Trump Real Estate, to add further legitimacy that the boarding house was on his land the whole time. Wow. And that is how the Trump family first <laughs> entered into the real estate business in the United States. Through uh, Through lying and scheming and bribery. This act of fraud was their first foray into real estate. I knew it! <laughs> Isn't anybody surprised? I'm not surprised. You're not surprised? This is not a political podcast. Thought coming I the whole time? I No, I didn't. But now but now that I know it, I can say, oh, but I saw that coming. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, shady. Yeah, shady Very, dealings. But he came... He, so he starts... He's back in Germany. He's cutting people's hair. He's, <laughs> he's pulling wine grapes. He comes to New York. He stays there for a little bit. Cut, and he buys his nice restaurant. And then... And then just... <laughs> It's gold, man. That's the thing. Is the gold Trumps, fever. and that's why there is an excessive use of gold in Trump <laughs> properties to this day. That's why mm. they got you shit. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. 
By July, the mm. matter was settled. Uh, Rudebeck obtained a patent on the entirety of his claim, which in essence made it his private property, including the land the boarding house was on. Uh, there were several other small dwellings of the land occupying his claim, so he sent officials to collect $10 a month on rent from everyone living on the land, Trump included. Oh, I, I hadn't even thought about it. So there were other people on yeah, his Yeah, there's like, other miners out there that, had, that okay. kind of live in, because he had a huge parcel of land. And sure. so people would kind of like set up shop while they were mining. And so he sends, says, hey, okay, every, everybody who's living on my land now has to pay me $10 a month in rent. Would Trump be the most sizable occupant of his I'm land? I'm not sure. Most people, okay. most of these would probably have been single dwellings. Most notable, though. Yeah, okay. most notable. Mm-hmm. Well, probably. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure who else is living on the land, but there's a fair amount of people, but probably individual miners and mining mm-hmm. partners. Just like uh, we, we, we can't know for sure if there wasn't just hand holding and tea drinking. Yeah. But probably we, we don't know. Mm. It's the frontier. So when he tried to collect the rent, People lost their minds. Really? Yeah. Uh, the Ever- Everett Herald reported, mm. quote, A great roar is now being made, and what the result will be, no one can tell. These were frontiersmen who lived off the grid and weren't happy they suddenly had a landlord because a piece of paper in the city told them they did. Mm. A week after the first attempts at collecting rent, a vigilante group tore down the jail which was still under construction. Oh, shit. Because they don't want this land to be developed. They're like, no, we're just out here mining. Yeah. We don't need a jail here. We don't need a a landlord. We just want to be left alone. Yeah. But the city continued to grow, and Trump ended up buying his land from Rudebeck. Oh, it, oh, table's turn. Yeah. All right. And so all these little miners are just out in the cold yeah. at this point? Mm-hmm. Those poor guys. Yeah, more people moved to the small town. Uh, asbestos was discovered nearby, Ooh. which added further mining opportunities. Oh. So everybody starts rushing out there to mine the asbestos. This is, Because this is the course, 1890s. Because I've forgotten, they don't know yet. They don't know yet, no. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. They, yeah. Okay. So that's a good thing from where they're <laughs> from, from where they they're sitting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sweet. Let's go. What? We don't yeah. know. Let's go into this enclosed area where there's asbestos and whack pickaxes oh, at it. These poor little miners that now they're on somebody else's land and they have to pay them back rent. And, and then now they're, they're, they're going to get mesothelioma. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, he continued to operate business in Monte Cristo, Cristo and in 1896 ran for Justice of the Peace. Which he won in a thirty-two to five victory. Ooh, those five guys! <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, That's five holdouts. Just almost the piece. Mm-hmm. Okay. In 1897, the Klondike Gold Rush went into full swing, and people started passing in massive numbers through the Northwest, looking to go to the Great White North and seek their fortune. Sure. Uh, Trump returned to Seattle and opened another restaurant. This one at 207 Cherry Street. He had done well in Monte Cristo, and his new restaurant was a bit nicer than the dairy restaurant had been. It was also just a block away from the most popular theater in town, the Seattle Theater, which featured acts such as Professor Bristol's Educated Horses. Oh my God, what I wouldn't pay! Right? That's right up. That is right up my alley. How I would love to go see an old vaudeville act like that. that. So, do you know anything about? His I don't know. I did. I didn't dig too deep, but I I did a little googling of Professor Bristol's yeah. Educated, and I didn't find much. I assume it's like how many apples are in my hand <laughs> tap tap yeah little math tricks and things yeah. like that yeah oh i'd love to see that mm-hmm. kidding me oh yeah uh he was making such a profit he was able to pay off his mortgage in four weeks mm. some friends of his from monte cristo were already in the klondike before the announcement of the gold strike was made in mid-july of 1997 uh and he had partial ownership in a claim he shared with them They filed a few other claims in his name and quickly sold them. The demand for land was high and rising quickly, meaning that some of the lands they claimed sold in less than 24 hours. Oh. Stake a claim. You want my claim? Double what I paid for it. Immediate turnaround. Wow. People are going crazy up in the Klondike right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Allured by adventure and profit, Frederick Trump sold his restaurant, transferred his land holdings to his sister, and headed north in the spring of 1898. To his sister. To not, his sister. Not as common at that time, I would think. Oh, uh, well, he wanted leave to... land to a lady person? He wanted to keep it in the family. Yeah. So he didn't want there to be any disputes over the land, and he didn't want it to leave it to a business no partner. Brothers, no brothers or sons at this point? Uh, no sons. No yeah. sons at this I point. I mean, I just I just inherently don't trust women. <laughs> as one myself, mm-hmm. knowing how untrustworthy we are. You heard it here first. Alicia okay. Wickstead is not to be I trusted. Don't, I don't trust ladies. 
Uh, so, uh, okay, so he's leaving it, so his first thought, leaving it in the family. Yes, yeah. exactly. So okay. we can come back and just get it back yeah, from his sister. Right, when, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. uh, Trump got into a crowded ship and made the long journey to Alaska. Mm-hmm. From Skagway, he took the infamous Dead Horse Trail over the mountain passes to Bennett Lake. Doesn't sound like a, a real good trail. No. Uh, it was at Bennett Lake he opened up the Arctic Restaurant, which was in operation for a while before he opened a second establishment, the new Arctic Restaurant and Hotel on Front Street in Whitehorse. Mm-hmm. Uh, both served as a stopping off point for the 100,000 miners that were trying to make their way north to Dawson City and dreams of gold. Hmm. So he doesn't actually he doesn't actually go to Dawson. It's all these are all establishments on the way, on the trail on the way up. Right. Uh, he and a few business partners built a two-story restaurant and inn. They served salmon, duck, caribou, and oysters. Wow. Yum. What does caribou taste like? Uh, I'm guessing it tastes like deer. That's I'm guessing correct. venison? Let me rephrase. What is venison? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I've ever I had don't venison. think I ever have either. I don't actually. Know. Yeah. Okay. I'm well, not sure. Yeah. We covered that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Yukon Star wrote of the Arctic, mm-hmm. quote, For single men, the Arctic has the best restaurant, but I would not advise respectable women to go there to uh-huh. sleep as they are liable to hear that which would be repugnant to their feelings and uttered to by the depraved of their own sex. It's another brothel. <laughs> it's another brothel. I yeah. knew it. Mm-hmm. Okay. A whole bunch of brothels. This, let me just so there had to be like legitimate combination hotels slash restaurants establishments in U- the United States at this time. Well, this, but is, this is in Canada. It's, oh, this is this in, is in Canada. Canada. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So, but in the, in the in the in general, uh, did did he just always was it always that like if you had the the space. And the willingness to make money, why not get some ladies in there to entertain gentlemen? I, I don't know. I don't know why he... I mean, I'm sure there would have been hotels that didn't really serve as brothels, but okay. brothels were also looked at kind of differently sure. than they are now. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were, I mean, certainly more socially acceptable right. uh, at this point. Okay. But as far as, I mean, he's he's looking to make a buck. He's yeah. an immigrant looking to make a fortune in the new world. Sure. And so that's an opportunity that you have. Mm-hmm. Also, who knows if a German immigrant would have been able to run a place like that at this time period. Oh, um, sure. Which I, I'm not sure. That's pure speculation. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's just, I mean, this is just the business he got into. And why he did not get into a different business, sure. I can't tell. But not terribly uncommon. Not terribly uncommon. Yes. For, for places like this, no. These places would have existed... Especially in the West. Right. All over, all over the place. Prostitution was huge mm-hmm. in westward expansion. So don't bring the kids or the wife unless, uh, she's, uh, uh she's open mm-hmm. to things. Yeah, okay. Exactly. All right. Uh, again from Gwenda Blair, quote, as somebody trying to attract business to his restaurant, of course he would have liquor. Of course he would arrange easy access to women. Mm, easy. Old easy access. Old easy access. Oh. The Klondike years were incredibly profitable for Trump. Uh, the remoteness of the area and the massive flux of miners meant that one could charge an exorbitant amount for a room. Mm. Food, liquor, and other comforts were inflated to an insane degree. Mm -hmm. By 1901, things started to die down. For one, the Canadian Mounties had initially tolerated the rowdiness of the saloons slash hotels, but they were starting to crack down on the lawless atmosphere. Mm. The punishment for a number of infractions was banishment or forced labor. Oh, wow. Yeah, you never banish people anymore. They never do. Yeah. Wow. Okay, You'd so, be banished from town. So I assume there's enough rowdiness that it's spilling out onto the streets. It's not like it's in, it's it's not like it's always contained just within the quiet confines of the hotel. Right, it's causing yeah. problems through town. Mm-hmm. So of course the Mounties got to get on it. Yeah. So these punishments would have been doled out if one was caught cheating at cards, mm-hmm. causing a public disturbance, or drinking on Sunday. Oh. Drink on Sunday, you get banished. It's the Lord's Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, saloons were typically shut down one minute before midnight on Saturday nights. Oh, that, I'm sure, didn't cause any problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's just roll everybody off. Mm-hmm. Tick, 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 and yep. we're all and done. done. And start praying. Mm-hmm. More importantly, the claims weren't producing gold. Mm. Many of the miners had gone home and the stampede was over. Frederick left as well, having made a comfortable nest egg and a grand adventure, he was ready to settle down. How old was he at this point? At this point, let's see, this is 1901, Mm -hmm. so he would be, he was born in 1869, Mm -hmm. so that would make him... Uh, (laughs) 40. 32. Okay. Didn't do that? Yeah. Yeah, Uh, so he's about 32 at this Uh time. He's been through a lot for a 32 year old. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Makes me feel lazy. Yeah, me too. Uh, Frederick married a young German woman named Elizabeth, who was his neighbor growing up in Kallstadt. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. How did they hook up? He went back to Germany for a little he while. Went back he went back to, to okay. Germany. Yeah. Got it. yeah. Uh, then the two moved to New York, but decided they would rather make their permanent home back in Germany. 
Uh, when he returned to Germany, he had earned about twenty thousand dollars, the equivalent of around half a million dollars today. Oh, wow! So he's doing pretty well. Pretty good. Germany did not welcome his return. Oh no! What happened? Well, Germany uh, had mandatory military conscription. Conscription. Mm -hmm. uh, all young men were expected to serve, and because he left when he was sixteen, and now he was returning home. He's thirty-five at this point. Mm -hmm. He turns turned home at thirty-five. He was viewed as a draft dodger. Oh, yeah. would he really? Would he have been aware of that, or would this have? Just no, he would have been aware of it. Okay, yeah. this mm -hmm. is so. All right. Yeah. Uh, he had also paid no taxes in the time he was gone, so he was a tax evader on top of that. Oh Lord. Yeah, from Gwenda Blair, quote. When Friedrich applied to regain German citizenship, he hit a second big bump. He had left his native country when he was too young to do military service, which was compulsory in Germany, and he was returning after he was over the age limit. He insisted that the only reason he had immigrated was to provide for his widowed mother, but the authorities dismissed him as a draft dodger. Mm. So Frederick and Elizabeth were deported. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. What about his widowed mother, by the way? What's happening with her? I don't think she's doing all right. Okay. Fine. <laughs> They've got the vineyard. Is They've got those other people. Probably right. not the real reason he Probably left. a lot. Yeah. Okay, so they're... But I, I don't know. It could have been. But I, yeah. I think that he was, just, he was just going off to try to seek adventure and right. to seek his fortune in the new land, not wanting to work on the family business. Gotcha. Uh, they returned to New York and settled in Queens in 1905, hmm. where he worked as a restaurant manager and a barber. They had three children, Elizabeth, Fred, and John. Mm -hmm. World War I was a uh, difficult time for the Trump family. Uh, from Gwenda Blair again. Quote, there was a rising tide of anti-German sentiment in America, manifested in accusations of disloyalty against people with German backgrounds, diatribes against music by German composers, even bonfires of books by German authors. People with German names changed them, and readership plummeted for the nation's hundreds of German language publications. Yeah. This is just considering the current position regarding immigration of yeah. the Trump family mm -hmm. and considering this hotbed of mess that he was in as an yes. immigrant himself. It's just, there's a lot, Chris, there's a lot of irony here. <laughs> there is a lot I of irony. there's a lot of irony here. <laughs> there is a I'm lot of irony, yeah. All right. Uh, during the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918, Frederick Trump succumbed to pneumonia and died at the age of 49. Oh, very young. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shortly before he died, he started making real estate investments in Queens, mm -hmm. where his family lived. His widow, Elizabeth, took over his investments, and when he was old enough, his son, Fred, got into the business as well. Mm -hmm. They called themselves Elizabeth Trump and son, which eventually turned into the Trump Organization, LLC. Mm. Fred Trump grew the company until it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes, he did. And today, the Trump Organization is worth billions of dollars. Wow. Wow. Uh, in his 1987 book, The Art of the Deal, Donald Trump lied about his heritage and claimed his paternal grandfather came from Sweden. No, he did not. He did. Uh, uh, let me just admit, I have not read The Art of the Deal. Yeah. It's on my bookshelf. Why? What was his... And does it, or does anybody know why? He, Nobody really he knows why. Uh, there's a lot of speculation in his... <clears throat> biographer, or uh, Friedrich Trump's biographer, actually wrote a book about all three generations of the Trump family. Mm. And uh, uh, those, those three generations, Friedrich Trump, Fred Trump, and Donald Trump. And her speculation is that they end up with this really kind of self-loathing about their heritage because of all the anti-immigrant sentiment that happened when they when World War I came around and then was only exacerbated when World War II came around. Um and that that would have probably been pretty deep seated into them. And, uh, uh, Elizabeth Trump, um, Donald Trump's grandmother died when I think he was 20. Mm -hmm. So he would have known her and, right. and, and, and been aware certainly of his family's heritage. Wow. This is an interesting, because they're a product of the time in that they experienced so much anti German sentiment. Mm -hmm. And instead of making it, it it's caused them to dislike their own, supposedly supposedly same, but we don't really perhaps, know if, were, yeah. if we were to guess it why trump lied in his biography perhaps and now instead of being open to the to make america welcoming for immigrants it's uh no because they treated us like shit we were treated like shit yeah, so, I don't know. I mean, it's we can we can only speculate at this we point. We can. I mean, it's what he does all the time. It's true. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> frankly, we can say yeah. anything we want about him. That's um, true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is absolutely fascinating. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. 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 I'm just you know I'm I'm not shocked by any of it, but I am. Yeah. But I am. Yeah. So wow. it all it all happened. It all. I mean, his whole kind of business career. Mm -hmm. He was in New York for a while, but his uh, his whole business career kind of started in Seattle in That's Pioneer nice. Square. Yeah, because I know a lot of famous people. 
varying of varying degrees have passed through Seattle over the years. People you may not have expected. Would, if in a million years, I never would have said, "Oh, maybe Donald Trump's uh, grandfather." Mm-hmm. Maybe he. Did. I would not have guessed that. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty a pretty interesting. I don't know. It's just, it's just not something you would expect. No, it isn't. And it's I only learned about this a couple of weeks ago, and I was very surprised yeah. when I learned about this as well. It's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, what I like to think about is because you and I both know who Lou Graham is. Me and too. if you're listening, then there's a good chance you also know Lou Graham ran a house of prostitution in Pioneer Square. Um, there is a roughly 100% chance that Lou Graham and Donald Trump's grandfather knew each other. Well, yeah, they could see each other and speak German to each yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. And they were both German out. immigrants in the same line of work yeah. working across the street from each other. Maybe they sh- share ladies or (laughs) or, no I mean not a literal like she'll come work at your house on Thursday we're closed for for tea Mm -hmm. or whatever you know I don't know if you did that. They, that probably didn't happen. The prostitution <laughs> happened. But they, yeah, they'd get together and chat about old Germany, I should like mm-hmm. to think. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff, like, it's it's easy to kind of look at this and be like, oh, yeah, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of this stuff wasn't really, wouldn't have been super uncommon. He would have been seen as probably a shrewd businessman at this point. And it wasn't necessarily super outside the realms of the morals at the time. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to impose our kind of morality on, on the kind of stuff that he's doing. Yes, but. it will. Is, isn't it's always. easy and satisfying it's easy and to do very, that. Very satisfying. But yeah, this it all kind of started in Pioneer Square. Wow. Well, wow. I, that's something I did not know, and now I know it. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to the Seattle Files, and thank you so much, Alicia, for being here. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, I'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode and a new guest. If you have an episode or a topic that you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at the Seattle Files at gmail.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook, uh, subscribe and rate in iTunes. Uh, again, we have a new episode every Tuesday. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. And thank you again, Alicia. 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 Back next week.